Welcome to Elevate, the masterclass where we dissect the elements of exceptional achievement and lifestyle design with a focus on personal growth and real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chesser. I'm so thankful to have you here, and I'm blessed and grateful to be sitting down with Dr. Lisa Barrett today, who is among the top 1% most cited scientist in the world for her revolutionary research in psychology and neuroscience. And we're gonna learn today how to maximize that three pound mass in between our skull, right? What this thing you know that we know about is our brain. How can we really maximize this amazing limitless tool towards creating the reality that we want in our life, towards designing our life, towards designing our business, towards designing our emotions and the fulfillment that we want in our life, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right? We do all of this. We strive for excellence. We strive to grow. We strive to build a portfolio or build businesses or become a better leader or all of these things because we want a life of fulfillment, right? We want to be happy. We want to experience that growth, that can, that expansion rather than that contraction. And so it's very, very important for us to understand you know, what is it inside of us that really allows us to do that? And so today is that day you're going to learn so much about psychology, about neuroscience, and really what that means and how this awareness can really take your life to the next level. So I want to encourage you to buckle up because we are going to take it to another level. I want to welcome you back to the show where we sit down for mind expanding conversations with influential authorities in real estate, as well as top experts in other industries and disciplines. And of course, today is the day where we have a top expert, a number one, like really like top 1% in the world, scientist, neuroscientist. And this is for leaders, entrepreneurs, and real estate investors who have a burning desire for the extraordinary. If you're enjoying Elevate, we invite you to follow us, give us a rating, a review, subscribe to the show, because we are bringing the heat. We're bringing the best in the world. And we're going to continue to distill the mindset, the habits, the routines, the systems, the strategies and so much more from people like Dr. Lisa Barrett, so that you can apply those to your life, so that you can elevate your business, so that you can elevate your emotions, so that you can elevate your experience while you're here on this planet. And at the end of the day, guys, I'm just so grateful that you're here. I'm so thankful that you're listening to Elevate. And I wanna encourage you, if you're enjoying this, share this with a friend, because at the end of the day, it's about abundance. The more that you give, the more you receive. And it's all about really that giving and it's a beautiful thing. So I just want to thank you for listening to Elevate. And with all that said, I want to dive in here and I want to introduce you to Dr. Lisa Barrett, who is among, like I said, the top 1% most cited scientists in the world for her revolutionary research in psychology and neuroscience. She is a university distinguished professor of psychology at Northeastern University with appointments at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. She is also the chief science officer for the Center of Law, for Law, Brain and Behavior at Harvard University. In addition to the book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain and How Emotions Were Made, Dr. Barrett has published over 240 peer-reviewed scientific papers appearing in Science, Nature, Neuroscience, and other top journals in psychology and cognitive neuroscience, as well as six academic volumes published by Guilford Press. She also has given a popular TED Talk with over 6 million views. You definitely want to go check that out. We'll put a link in the show notes. It's phenomenal. Dr. Barrett received a National Institutes of Health Directors Pioneer Award for her revolutionary research on emotion in the brain. These highly competitive multi-million dollar awards are given to scientists of exceptional creativity who are expected to transform biomedical and re behavioral research. She also received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2019, the APS Mentor Award for Lifetime Achievement in 2018, and the APA Distinguished Scientific, Scientific Contribution Award in Psychology in 2021. Among her many accomplishments, Dr. Barrett has testified before Congress, presented her research to the FBI, consulted to the National Cancer Institute, and appeared on Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman and the Today Show with Maria Shriver, and has been a featured guest on public television and podcast radio programs worldwide. And now today she is on Elevate Podcast. She is also an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. 
and the Royal Society of Canada. So without further ado, enjoy this phenomenal, insightful conversation with Dr. Lisa Barrett. Lisa, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. You know, it's funny about that. Uh, a lot of people don't ask me back, how am I doing? Um, I don't know why. Yeah, I'm like, all right, you're good. But um, no, I appreciate that. I'm doing well. And I'm really excited to have a conversation with you and really excited to dive into that beautiful mind of yours so that we can all better understand our own beautiful mind so much more. But before we do that, I'd be curious um, if you were to describe yourself in the way that your closest family members and friends would describe you, how would you describe yourself? It depends on who it was. So if you were asking my daughter, she would probably say control freak, like bossy. You know, she's always like, she's treat, you know, my daughter's 22 and I'm, you know, she's been living in our house for more than a year now. And so we're, we're both working. We're all working really hard not to slip into old patterns, let's just say. Um, but um, I think uh, people would say um, empathic, loyal, fierce at times, like intense, like not willing to compromise on quality or validity or things like that. I'm very willing to compromise in interpersonal domains, but not in science. Science is not like having a dinner party where people disagree, you know, and where you're looking for consensus. Um, I think that's how they would describe me. One, one colleague I have um, describe me as complex, that I just, I don't, I don't favor simple, single answers to things, right? I sort of look for, I'm enticed by complexity. That's probably true. I love um, if that. If you ask my mother, she would say, you know, I'm a shit disturber. That would be her, that would her, be her description of me. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we're all complex, right? You know, in, in life and business and you know, everything that we're all about on Elevate is complex. And well, how do, how do your friends describe you? Oh, look at this. All right. You're turning it around on me. I like it. Uh, you know, I think my friends would describe me as driven, as uh, yeah. optimistic, as curious, as fun, as a little bit rebellious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, but, but you know, about but the same with you is that it's it's multidimensional, it's multifaceted, it's not just one layer. You can't really describe yourself or someone and, and also some people around you may describe you in a different capacity. Like you said, like your mom would describe you in one way, and maybe your daughter and, and other colleagues, they may mm -hmm. describe you as fierce when your daughter's like, Oh, she's not fierce. Or I don't know. I mean, maybe not. Maybe she does say that too. But um, does that resonate with you, Lisa? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. I think people would would say that. Um, yeah, I don't think necessarily people would say I'm fun. You know, I live in a house where I am the least funny person of the three people who live here. You know, like my husband and my daughter are really funny, like seriously funny. My they could be like stand up comedians funny. I mean, they are funny. And so I just am constantly playing the straight man, which means, um, you know, I don't, I'm often funny, not on purpose, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think multidimensional, you know, there's this old saying in, in psychology, you can't be a self by yourself. Mm. And I think that's really true. You know, who you are in some part, in some way depends on who you're with. Um, and it's always important to choose to be around the people who allow you to be your best self. That's phenomenal. That's really, really good. And, you know, I just find it to be really interesting. And, and by the way, thank you again for asking me, turning this thing back around. And, and I noticed that when I, when I describe myself, it's almost like you had already read that. Like I, I had described myself and you were nodding your head like, yeah, I can see that. So where, where does that come from? I mean, would you consider yourself someone who's proficient at reading other people just through your study? Or is that just a part of who you are inquisitively? Yeah, the thing is, we don't really read other people. That's a, sort of a common misnomer, right? So that thank we, you. That's great. We, um, the human brain is constantly guessing about what the nod of a head means, or the curl of a lip, or um, you know, a particular body posture. Um, movements are don't have inherent psychological meaning. And so you have to guess your brain is guessing and it's usually guessing pretty automatically and pretty fluidly without any awareness on your part. So to you, it feels as if you're reading, but you're really not reading because, you know, a smile can mean many different things. 
um, it, it, depending on the situation. A scowl can mean, you know, I'm angry. It can mean um, what you just said is not funny. And, you know, um, um, but in a, in a sort of a humorous way, it can mean that you have gaffes, you know, or that you're confused or that you're concentrating really hard. So um, I, I would say that, um, you know, there are some characteristics in people. There's, there's this whole literature called thin slices, thin slice um, perceptions of people, which just means you show a video of someone for a minute or two, sometimes even like 20 seconds. And then the um, perceiver is asked to make judgments about that person. And there are some, there are some characteristics that are easily guessed quickly. Um, I would say um, that's what the evidence suggests, anyways. Um, and so, also, I just think in in a business like yours, doing a podcast, you know, you the people you don't usually find a lot of timid people. <laughs> that's a good you point. Know? I mean, over the past five years, I've I don't know how many hundreds of podcasts I've done at this point, and you know, um, some people are a little more intense. Some people are a little more relaxed, you know, but everybody is sort of social and kind of outgoing a little bit and, um, you know, pretty confident in their own, you know, domain that they've carved for themselves. And um, th I think that that makes sense. It, uh, po podcasts are, are challenging things to do, I would imagine. Yeah, no, that's, well, it's interesting. And I'm sure that this is probably number one, you know, maybe of your favorite podcast that you've done. So we'll, we'll just make I'm that. I'm sure it is. I'm sure that's <laughs> We're going to, we're yeah. predicting the predicting brain is really going ahead and filling in those blanks here. But, but Lisa, before we dive into some amazing stuff with you, I really, I'd like to take a, a few steps back um, because I'd love to know, like, where did your fascination begin with neuroscience? Like, was it just the pure curiosity or tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, no, it was much more pragmatic. Um, I, I would say, well, you know, even when I was in high school, I was really, really interested in physiology. So um, I got interested in physiology actually because there was a gym class that I really wanted to take, which was human anatomy and physiology. And I really wanted to take this gym class, but in order to take this gym class, you also had to learn how to lift weights and use universal machines, which, you know, I'm probably dating myself, but universal machines, I'm five foot two. Okay. And I took this class with a bunch of like football players in my high school who were considerably larger in all dimensions than me. And so it was me five foot two and these like big hulking, you know, um, football players. Um, and um, it was kind of a fair trade. I mean, you know, I, uh, they helped me with the universal machines and I developed actually a love of weightlifting, which I've done my whole life since then. And uh, I helped them with the, you know, anatomy and physiology, but I always really loved anatomy and physiology. And even in college, uh, in university, I, you know, took some of those courses. Um, but in, uh, when I was doing my PhD and afterwards, I realized that there were certain kinds of questions that I was not really going to be able to answer unless I knew more about the brain and how it worked. And um, so I started with a, a neuroanatomy class. And even though I was a professor already, tenured professor already, and um, I um, just kept studying. And so, you know, I'm still learning about evolutionary neuroscience and developmental neuroscience, which means the, you know, how a, how a nervous system is set up in an embryo, um, and so on. And you know, it's it's just a constant lifelong, I think, um, journey because there are a lot of really interesting things. Um, you know, like for example, with the last book that I just wrote, Seven and a Half Lessons about the brain that was really spurred on by a number of reasons. But one was, I just started wondering like, why do we even have a brain? It's a very expensive organ, that three pounds of you know meat between your ears. So why do we even have it? What's it good for? It's the most metabolically expensive organ you have. Um, and it's also pretty delicate. And so it seems like, you know, there must be an awfully good reason to have it, to spend all of that, um, all of those metabolic resources on it. Um, and so I think now it's more curiosity than anything else, but initially it was really pragmatic. There were just certain things I wanted to understand. And I realized 
pretty early on that I needed to really have a good working knowledge of the nervous system, its anatomy, its physiology in order to be able to answer those questions. I, I find it to be fascinating and I've become more and more enthralled with how our nervous system works, how our brain works, um, just as I've gotten more and more entrenched as an entrepreneur, as an investor, because, you know, I feel like entrepreneurs and investors are on the front lines of, you know, the roller coaster of emotions that we experience in life, right? Because, you know, sometimes you can feel like, hey, you're, you're going off a cliff or, you know, there's major challenges that you've got to figure out, you've got to overcome. And to me, I think it's really important that we have an awareness of how does our brain work? How do emotions work? And how can we, you know, under, and use that gap of understanding to, you know, really using it in a better way rather than letting our brain and our nervous system use us. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. I guess what I would say is it's always really been my view that, um, you know, I'm not really a particularly big fan of self-help books or things like that. You know, it's a sort of an occupational hazard, right? Um, but I do think that science and philosophy are tools for living. If you do understand a little bit about how your brain works, you can actually architect your life differently. Like not everybody can control everything that they wanna control about their lives. And not everyone has equal amounts of control. Some people have much more control than others, um, you know, because of their life circumstances. Um, but everybody can control something a little more than they do. And that means everybody has the opportunity to architect their lives, you know, and make their lives, tweak their lives in ways to be a little bit better um, than they are. And, um, and that's easier to do when you know a little bit about, you know, how your brain works and, um, and how it talks to your body. You know? No, and I, I love that. And I love that you use the word architect because it obviously resonates with a lot of the real estate folks that are listening today. But, you know, you think about this amazing tool that we have, right? One of the most powerful tools in the universe, really, and using it to architect our lives. And you've, you've actually, you know, really put out work that says that really our brains shape our reality. And you've actually gone into depth about that. Could you talk a little bit about how our brains can actually shape reality and what that actually looks like? Well, there are many ways in which this is the case. Um, it's so, it's hard to know where to start actually, but um, I would say, you know, first of all, everything that you experience and everything that you do is some combination of what is occurring right now in the world and in your body and what has happened to you in the past. So your brain, what you see, what you hear and so on is some combination of in your brain, you know, cause you see, you don't see in your eyes, you see in your brain. You don't hear in your ear, you hear with your brain. I mean, you need your ear to be able to hear, but the hearing actually occurs in your brain, right? When you, if you pinch yourself, you know, you feel it actually this pinch in your brain, not really in your hand. So everything is happening really in your brain. You need the sensory surfaces of your body to get information into your brain, but the, all of the experiencing is happening in there. And what you experience is your brain, what the, the contents of what you experience, what you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you smell, what you feel, is some combination of the information that your brain has taken in and information it conjures from your past that it remembers. You don't have a conscious experience of remembering, but your brain is constantly remembering, meaning it is constantly reassembling bits and pieces of your past experience in order to make sense of what's going on right now. And so in that sense, what you, what you experience as reality is partially constructed by you, by your brain. Um, but there's another way in which reality is constructed, and that is that humans don't just have the capacity to experience things in the world. We have the capacity to create reality in the world by imposing functions on, on things that they don't have by virtue of their physical nature. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you look at all of the things that have served as currency or money throughout the course of human history, those things 
have never had inherent value. They only have value because a group of people agree that they have value. So salt, diamonds, barley, shells, big rocks in the ocean, little pieces of paper, little pieces of plastic, promises of, of little pieces of paper in the future, right? right. Like contracts. A <laughs> yeah, contracts, mortgages. My favorite one re of recent uh, is our air rights. You know, oh yeah, the, that's a good yeah. one. Yeah, air rights are, I mean, air rights to me are like the perfect, perfect example of something completely made up. Or insurance or something, you know. Or insurance, right. And so all of these things have value because we all agree they have value. And then that if we all agree that they can be traded for material goods then they can be, and then therefore de facto they have value. But if some people disagree, if some people withdraw their consent as what happened with mortgages, right? Um, then they lose their value because the value is not intrinsic to the thing itself. It's in the value is um, something we all agree on. And this is true for many, 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 many things that we take for granted in our everyday life, that humans, you know, all animals act on their environments in ways that they need to keep themselves alive. Humans add to their environments in quite substantial ways. And I, by that, I don't mean just that we build houses and we build buildings and, you know, because termites build these like, you know, five foot, you know, 10 foot like mounds in Africa, you know, I mean, animals can also build very impressive things. But we make stuff up like, you know, um, a country. And then we draw a line in the sand and we create, you know, citizens and immigrants by right. just with just by agreement, just by agreement. Um, and then, you know, when some people withdraw their agreement, then, you know, there has to be a negotiation about the meaning about like what's what's going to be what is going to be true what's going to be true tomorrow is this boundary going to maintain you know continue to be a boundary or do other boundaries need to be put there so that's how you know a couple of col a handful of colonies went from being colonies to being the united states of america that's how yugoslavia went from being a single country to a bunch of separate countries um and so on and so forth. So there are very, 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 very substantial ways in which we create the reality that we live in. And sometimes the, well, this is called social reality. And sometimes the social reality, this made up reality that we have, that we make for ourselves can have really serious impacts for physical reality. So I find it to be f so fascinating. And, and I was really blown away by what you, you've all know Harari wrote about in Sapiens when he talked about the consciousness revolution. And he talked about, you know, the agreement between human beings that said that, you know, corporations were a thing. And obviously that was over many, many years when that started to develop. But it is interesting to really take a step back and say, these are just, you know, collective agreements that we all have with each other. And, and it's, each of our brains, like we got 7 billion plus people on this planet, each of our brains together are shaping that reality, right? Oh, for sure. And you know, you think, you think that, um, you know, like you think, well, I've never actually agreed that m little pieces of paper can be, you know, our money, but yes, you have, you have every single time you've received or, 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 or traded one of those little pieces of paper, right? So, I mean, I wear rings on my left hand. I don't walk around saying I'm married, I'm married, I'm married, I'm married, I'm married, I'm married to every person I meet. I don't even walk around showing my rings. I just have rings on my hand. And this is only a symbol of something because we all agree that it's a symbol of something. And actually in some countries, it's on your right hand that you wear it, not on your left. That's the symbol, right? So in our country, you know, nodding your head means yes and shaking your head means no. They are symbols of particular, these actions are symbols for a particular meaning, but these are also social reality. We're imposing a meaning on a, on a, imposing a function on a physical action that it doesn't have by virtue of evolution or, or anything. And in other countries, you know, like in India, the meanings are reversed. 
same thing with a scowl. A scowl is not a universal expression of anger. People scowl when they're angry in large urban countries about like, you know, large urban centers about like 30% of the time, which is more than chance. So it gets you a paper in a really good peer review, you know, journal. Um, but that means 70% of the time people are doing something else that's meaningful with their face when they're angry. And that's low reliability. And, you know, for scowl as the universal expression of anger, it's actually a Western stereotype. And people scowl when they're not angry, as we said before. So again, um, we're imposing a meaning, a function on something physical that it didn't, it didn't, it doesn't have by virtue of its physical nature. And um, that's social reality. So I find it to be fascinating. And you think about evolution and where we've come from as a species and why we act the way we do now, why we experience a certain emotions that we do now. Perhaps it's because of a certain level of evolution that maybe we're not so different than we were a million years ago, perhaps. But, you know, one thing I think about frequently is like the amygdala and how it's, you know, it's, it's, it's putting, you know, cortisol into our bloodstream and it's making us stressed out and it's making us feel certain emotions. But what you've done is you've debunked sort of this lizard brain notion. Could you talk a little bit about that and really what that means for people that are, you know, on the front lines of, you know, the, the roller coaster of emotions as, as business people and investors? Sure. The amygdala is not the center for emotion in your brain. It does not put cortisol into your bloodstream and cortisol is not a stress hormone. Okay. You just, I just got educated. Thank you. Yeah. So <laughs> these amazing. are these are really these are myths they're modern myths that are really hard to they're hard to root out you know they're like dandelions they just keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back um so your brain did not evolve in in layers like sedimentary rock it's not like you have a it's not like you have a lizard brain you know or reptile brain for you know, your base instincts. And then on top of that, you have a system called a limbic system, limbic meaning border, border of the lizard brain uh, for emotion that you share with you know, ancient mammals like rats. And then later on top of that, you have a big cerebral cortex, which is where you know, rationality lives. That's a myth. Evolutionary neuroscientists have known for at least 50 years that that is not how your brain evolved. If you just look at brains of different animals, they, with the naked eye, they look different to the naked eye. But if you peer deep into the molecular structure of those, of those structures, the molecular structure of the individual cells, if you look at the genes of those cells, what you can see is that brains did not evolve that way. As bodies get bigger, brains get bigger. And as brains get bigger, they reorganize themselves. Their structure reorganizes, even though the neurons are the same as in the smaller brains. So what we can say is that actually every mammal brain that's ever been studied is, appears to be set up in, in the embryos of those animals, of that species, using exactly the same brain plan. And many, many, many parts of that brain plan are also shared with other vertebrates that don't have a cerebral cortex like a bird or that have a really small one like a lizard. The only animal on this planet that has a lizard brain is a lizard. And that lizard brain in a molecular sense looks really, really similar to your brain. So that's the first thing to understand. The second thing to understand is that um, you don't have really you know, the, the idea that, you, you know, that your brain is like a battleground between emotion and reason, that you have these like instinct, you know, an inner beast, right? This like ancient inner beast of these ancient circuits for emotions and, you know, instincts and that, that they're battling your neocortex for control of your behavior, rationality for control of your behavior. Um, and if, you know, if the cortex wins, then you're, a good person or you're a smart person, if the cortex loses, um, it's either because you didn't try hard enough and therefore you're immoral or you're, um, you're weak, in which case, you know, there's something wrong with you mentally. Like this idea is just, it's a complete story. It's a, it's a, 
it's really a morality story that goes all the way back to ancient Greece, to, to Plato, who believed that the human soul or the human psyche could be described, um, which doesn't exactly mean the human mind, but it's close enough for present purposes, um, that the human mind could be um, described as two chariot, two um, horses, one for instincts and one for emotions, and a charioteer to control them both, the human uh, rational um, creature. And that's just, you know, not, I mean, scientists in the 20th century took that story and tattooed it onto the brain, um, but it's really not true. And it's, it's not true in terms of how brains evolved and it's not true in terms of how brains function. So the truth is that if you look at the evidence, your brain is always controlling your body. Your body is always sending sense data back to your brain. And you don't experience that sense data, the, the beat of your heart, the tug of your lungs, the, the rushing of your blood and so on. You mostly don't experience that on a day to day, on a moment to moment basis, which is really good. Because if you did, you'd never pay attention to anything else outside your own skin ever again. Right now, you know, you and I are sitting here chatting and we have listeners who will be listening and each of us has a whole drama going on inside our own bodies that we're largely unaware of. But our brain makes us aware of the sort of the state of the body in a sense with simple feelings like feeling pleasant, feeling unpleasant, feeling worked up, feeling calm, feeling comfortable, feeling uncomfortable. These simple feelings are with you 24 seven. You know, your brain's always controlling your body. Your body's always sending information back to your brain. So that conversation is always ongoing. And you, for you all always feel affect. That's what we call it, affect, or you might call it mood, but it's with you all the time. Sometimes it's in the foreground of your experience and sometimes it's in the background, but it's still there, but it's always there there all the time, regardless of whether you're being rational or not. Rationality is not the absence of feeling. And sometimes your brain, your brain is always attempting to make sense of the imposed meaning on the sense data that it's receiving from the body and from the world. And sometimes it makes sense of those changes of that affect as emotions, but not always, but sometimes it does. And so the idea that emotions are issuing from some ancient inner beast that you have to wrestle with, it may feel that way to us, but that's actually not what's happening under the hood. Cortisol is not a stress hormone. Cortisol is a hormone that gets glucose into your bloodstream fast because your brain believes that you need it, that you have to do something hard that will require a metabolic outlay. Like maybe you have to move your body, like maybe you're exercising, or maybe you have to drag yourself out of bed in the morning. Right before you wake up in the morning, you have a surge of cortisol because you need that glucose to get yourself out of bed. You have a surge of cortisol before you exercise. You have a surge of cortisol before you learn something new because that's also a metabolically costly thing to do. Anytime your brain believes that there's a metabolic, a big metabolic outlay, it's gonna attempt to, um, it, the brain is constantly attempting to anticipate the metabolic needs of the body and meet those needs before they arise. So it doesn't stand you up and then raise your blood pressure to get the oxygen up to your brain because that would be metabolically costly. Instead, you know, it needs to make sure that the oxygen gets there as you need it, right? So it starts to raise your blood pressure as you stand, as your brain stands you up, it starts to raise blood pressure so that the oxygen can get there. Um, when we, um, when we uh, are about to eat, imagine eating or sit down to eat, we start salivating and we start salivating in advance because our brain's preparing us to break down the food, um, you know, um, and digest it. So it's all about um, anticipating needs and predicting those needs and trying to meet those needs before they arise. And that's what cortisol does. So a cortisol surge happens in moments of stress because stress is by definition, a moment when your brain believes there's going to be a big metabolic outlay that is required. 
That's but it. Can't that's that be harmful? Can't that be harmful if you're experiencing too much stress all the time? Well, what does it mean to experience too? Yes, it can be harmful, but what does it mean to experience too much stress all the time? So in um, when I'm talking about the way that the brain is regulating the body, I often use an analogy or metaphor of um, a budget, that your brain is running a budget for your body. And your brain is not budgeting money, obviously, it's budgeting glucose and salt and water, oxygen, and all the nutrients that are needed to keep you alive and well. And um, to do, you know, the most important thing from, you know, biology's perspective, right, which is to pass your genes on to the next generation, and then raise those offspring to reproductive age. Um, so you can think about eating healthfully and sleeping as deposits. And even you can think about like being around someone who you love and who loves you. It's kind of like, a, it's you can think of it as metaphorically like a deposit or something that just makes things cheaper. Like it's just, it makes it easy, you pay less. You pay less when you do things if you have someone around who is supportive and who loves you and you love them and you trust them. And then there are other things which are, you know, like withdrawals. Anytime you move your body is a withdrawal. Exercise, you could think of as a major investment. You're making a major withdrawal, but you're investing that in a healthier brain and a healthier body and a healthier memory in the future, right? That's that. So that's the way to think about it. I love um, that. Learning something new is an investment because it's metabolic. It's a metabolic investment because it's expensive to learn something new. So just like with your regular budget with your with your financial budget when you make a withdrawal you know you need to then make a deposit to replenish what you've spent and if you're going to spend a lot you usually want to save up first right and you know to make sure the money's there for when you need to have a big expenditure otherwise you're going to be paying a little bit of interest right so things are just a little more expensive than they need to be and it turns out that when things are a little more expensive than they need to be, because you're spending that you don't have. So for example, if I have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee that has caffeine in it, what I'm doing is I'm borrowing energy from tomorrow in order to spend it today. Serotonin, for example, people when they're depressed, they take serotonin, um, reuptake inhibitors, which leave serotonin in the synapses of their neurons longer. Serotonin is, is, a, is a chemical that lets you spend, metabolically spend when there's no immediate return on that investment apparent to you. It lets you forage for information. It lets you do stuff even though you don't know what the reward will be. You know, you're exploring. It's tracking what's called your reward history. So if your brain can, if your brain is predicting that somewhere down the road you're going to get a big reward for what you're doing now, it, you can expend the energy now in order to get that reward. But without serotonin, you can't really do that very well, and you have no energy. You have fatigue, and you have very little energy to do anything. You're not motivated to do anything. That's what it feels like. Um, it feels like tired or fatigued. Um, sometimes it feels like like a chronic kind of flu. Um, and so, um, you know, but without the temperature. But so, um, but the point is that, you know, you can think about this in economic terms. And so chronic stress is basically where you are um, expending energy and not, so you're making withdrawals and you're not making any deposits. You can put yourself into a, an, into a state of chronic stress by exercising too much and not sleeping enough and not eating healthfully, right? Exercise is only a good investment when you replenish what you've spent. And there's just so much to say about this. Like, I, I just have to tell you, as somebody who loves, loves, loves French fries, like they are God's most perfect food, seriously. <laughs> and when my, you know, when my daughter was a toddler, you know, there were these mothers, like, you know, these like have these like, you know, play groups and you take your kid and, you know, there was a couple, always a couple of mothers, you know, who like didn't like, you know, um, they didn't like the little, um, 
you know, crackers for kids and they wouldn't let their kids drink juice. And, you know, and I was just like, who are these people? <laughs> except, except they're right. They were right. And I was wrong. Most of the f- stuff that you find in supermarkets is pseudo food. It's actually not food that's healthful for your body. So good. You th- so true. You think that you're making deposits, but you're totally not making deposits. It's like you're writing, continually writing bad checks is really what it's like. So, you know, it looks like it's money, but then it turns out not to be money after all. And, that, and then it leaves you with a deficit. And that's exactly what a lot of like really super processed food is like. So if you think about your brain as running a budget for your body, and it's a little bit like you can, it's running your body like a, like, like a supply chain, basically, right? It needs to get stuff where it needs to be just as it needs it, not a little afterwards, but, but, you know, a little before or right on time, that's what it really needs to do. And you got a lot of cells and a lot of systems and they all have to be balanced. Um, uh, you know, a little bit of extra tax or a little bit of extra interest adds up over time. And that's chronic stress. Hey guys, just a quick word from our sponsor and we'll be right back to the show. This episode of Elevate is brought to you by CF Capital. And you know how much I love real estate and how it can be a vehicle towards creating any outcome that you want in your life, which is really why we created CF Capital, a real estate investment firm that focuses on acquiring and operating multifamily assets that provide stable cash flow, capital appreciation, and a margin of safety for our investors, for our partners, and for the people that we serve. Our team leverages its expertise in acquisitions and management to provide investors like you with superior risk-adjusted returns while placing a premium on preserving capital. Our mission is to provide property investment and asset management solutions to help investors maximize their returns by investing in high-value multifamily communities. Our philosophy is that we can elevate communities together through this process. And I want to invite you to go check out cfcapllc.com because we have a free ebook that's called the bottom line, the 10 ways to increase cash flow in an apartment complex. And I want to tell you that this is a value packed ebook. So I want to want to invite you to go check that out right now at cfcapllc.com. I think you're going to get a ton of value just from reading this, whether you apply it to your own business or whether you educate yourself further on what it would look like if you invested with CF Capital. So go check that out at cfcapllc.com. Again, that's cfcapllc.com and enjoy the rest of the show. And you You know, know, it really resonates with me. I was just going to say really quickly that it reminds me of the philosophy that easy choices equal a hard life and hard choices equal an easy life. Does that resonate with you, Lisa? It does. It absolutely does. You know, because the thing is that, you know, if you see water, little water bit dripping on a steel pipe, it's not going to eat through that pipe the first time, the second time, the third time, but eventually that drip is going to bore a hole through that pipe. And when it does, that's a really, really, really expensive thing to fix, if it's fixable at all. So I think it's important that you stress yourself. Your nervous system needs stress in order to function normally, but it needs good stress. And the only difference between good stress and bad stress is do you replenish what you spent? Mm. Do you That's replenish so what you spent? So, you know, not doing hard things. Like I try to tell people, just because you feel bad doesn't mean that something is wrong or that something bad is happening. It might mean that you just had a really big metabolic outlay. So have a nap, have some water, eat an apple. Like, I know that sounds a little flippant and I don't mean it to sound flippant, but it really is true that, um, that, you know, when you, when you are in the middle of a metabolic outlay, you're fighting an illness, you're exercising, you're, I don't know about you. I mean, Tyler, when you exercise, do you have, do you like exercising? Is it pleasant? I do. I've become, you know, not always, but I do like it. It's become a part of my life. That's for sure. I've been exercising every day, practically for more than 30 years. And I have an awareness of the fact that I'm going to feel good at the end. I think that's it for me too. I agree with you on that. But I still have to drag my ass up to my <laughs> gym in the morning upstairs, you know, where all my stuff is. And um, 
That's a good reminder too, by the way. I'll just say that because I have a, I have a workout coming up in about three hours today. I normally work out in the mornings, but I don't like working out at nighttime. And my mind is telling me, oh, this is going to be tough. This is, you're going to dread it. But I work out, you know, six days a week. And yeah. so that's a great reminder from you on that. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, one of the really interesting things about exercise is that it happens for, to, to, uh, for people at different times, but eventually in your workout, if you're working hard enough, eventually you're going to reach what's called your ventilatory load, which is your ventilatory threshold, which means you're now expelling carbon dioxide at the limit, at the, at the, at a rate limiting fat, like you can no longer expel carbon dioxide as fast as you, you know, you, you can't go faster basically. Mm -hmm. And so there's a point in your workout where you start to feel like, oh my God, I just really don't want to continue. And you have to learn that to push through that feeling. That's actually the place where a lot of people stop exercising because they don't, because it feels uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you learn when you're, you know, when you're training or when you have, you know, you're training for something, or if you just try to, to, to learn how to like, you know, cultivate exercise as a part of your life, you learn to cultivate that feeling. Like you're, you are aiming for that feeling because you know what it's going to feel like on the other side of that. Right. So true. Um, you know, and whether it's because you'll have a rush of, you know, it's not endorphins actually, which gives you those feelings. It's apparently cannabinoids. Who knew? Ah, but interesting. Endorphins don't apparently cross the blood brain barrier. I'm not an expert on this, but um, my understanding is, you know, we have an internal medicine cabinet, which includes cannabinoids. That is, that's why marijuana works as well as it does, because we have receptors for, you know, we have endocannabinoids, we have cannabinoid receptors, and that's why cannabis works for us as, a, you know, uh, a relaxant. Well, how um, fascinating, I mean, it's, it's honestly extremely fascinating, because ultimately what you're talking about is we know we've got to push beyond that discomfort, because we know the feeling that's on the other side of that. And ultimately, the word that I think is so fascinating is that feeling piece and the emotions yeah, piece, yeah, right? Yeah. Although, you know, some people don't have that. Like I don't get, I don't have that cannabinoid rush every time, but I know that if I get myself to the end of this workout, I could have peanut butter on toast. <laughs> right. I could have chocolate for dinner, you know, after dinner, I could have, there are all sorts of ways that I can reward myself in these very small ways, you know, just eating bread. I mean, you know, French bread is, I wouldn't call it a pseudo food. I'd call it dessert <laughs> because your brain, you know, your body metabolizes it like dessert basically. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, like we would, we would be shopping in the supermarket and, you know, my daughter would, you know, want when she was a little girl, she would want these, you know, like this, like the yogurt with the sprinkles and the, this and that. And I would look at her and I go, that is a treat. That's dessert. That's candy you know, this is what yogurt looks like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? and um, it turns out that this is really serious. It's the, 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 it's serious actually how foods can influence how your brain, how well your brain does body budgeting. Because if you start eating foods that have artificial sweeteners in them with no calories, your brain has just lost the sweet taste as a predictor of calories. Mm. So if your whole life, all you've eaten are whole foods. And so when something is sweet, it has calories. That's actually good because it means that your brain can properly predict, you know, what needs to happen in order for you to metabolize that, um, that food that you're eating to digest it and metabolize it efficiently. And if you break that predict, you break that predictive contingency. So sweetness now sometimes predicts calories, but not always and often not, that actually makes your metabolism less efficient. Read, you're paying a tax. And if you have a stressor, this, this research just kills me. I like guess as a, as a scientist, I find it really, really interesting, like really captivating, interesting. But as a human person, I find it, you know, distressing to say the least. And as a woman in this culture, I find it horrifying. If you are stressed within 
two hours of eating a meal, your ability to your, your body's and your brain's ability to metabolize that food costs you an extra, what is the equivalent of an extra 102 calories? Interesting. So because of the loss of efficiency due to um, cortisol release and other kinds of things that, you know, stress basically, it basically means that they're, um, your brain's expecting this big metabolic outlay, not a metabolic like deposit, which is what's happening. It really changes the sort of internal um, processing. And the result is that it is like the equivalent in effect of eating an extra 102 calories. So imagine a year of chronic stress that without changing anything that you eat, that's 11 extra pounds. That's not ideal. No. <laughs> Obviously that is not ideal at all. So you know things what? like, you know, sleeping and not getting enough sleep and stuff like that, which I would imagine, you know, I, I don't know about you. I spent probably the first 20 years of my adult life being sleep deprived totally. you know, because I was sleeping, not sleeping in, in favor of working um, uh, because I had, you know, a little kid to raise and stuff. Um, you know, it's, it, it, you, you pay a price for that. There's no doubt about it. And um, I just find your work to be so fascinating. And, and one thing that, you know, obviously we talked earlier about how our brains shape our reality. And I, I'm also of the belief that our emotion, emotions shape the quality of our life. And I love your study of emotions, but you've mentioned that, you know, our experiences, our emotions are not hardwired. They're actually predictions of what we expect a certain situation to create in terms of an emotion. So could you talk a little bit about that uh, just for, for a brief moment? Sure. So let's say you're walking in the woods. It's be this is best to illustrate with an example. So let's say you're walking in the woods, you're with a friend walking in the woods and you hear there's a rustling sound. Um, what happens, so if we just freeze time, what happens in that point is that your brain is gonna ask itself as it's doing all the time. It's not, it's not just in this instance, it's doing this always. Based on, like, given the current situation, the current physical state the body's in and the current, you know, sensory array of what's happening in the world, what is most likely to happen next? So you're walking in the woods with a friend and you hear rustling in the leaves. What is it? Well, it, it could be a snake or a small animal. It could be the wind. It could be, uh, you know, um, someone rooting around in there trying to find their lost keys, you know, or maybe a kid trying to find a ball. There are many, many things it could be. Your brain doesn't know what it is because it only is receiving the sense data, which is the consequence, the output, the, the, it's the, the, um, the effect of some cause, but it doesn't know what the cause of that rustling is. So it has to guess. And what it does, it doesn't wait to see what it is and then react because that is metabolically expensive. And also you can't, it's for the same reason why baseball is completely predictive sport. You know, the batter doesn't wait to see the ball from the pitcher before he swings. If he did that, he would never, ever, ever hit the ball. It's just physically impossible. Even the fastest batter could never do it because humans can't mount a motor response that fast. So the batter, is actually unconsciously predicting where the ball will be in a moment from now based on his past experience with his body in that state, the wind at that moment, this particular picture, this particular, right? So his brain is doing this like really complicated calculus and is predicting where the ball is gonna be in a moment from now. And he prepares to swing and launches the swing before he sees the ball. And that is the way that he can hit a fastball in a major league baseball game. So baseball is this really, really interesting sport because it's totally like a battle of wits between the pitcher and the batter. And in much the same way, you know, if there's that rustling in the leaves, your brain isn't gonna sit around. If it is a snake, you would never have a chance to run away fast enough before that snake bites you. So you really what's happening is your brain is predicting, it's, you, it's saying, well, the last time I was in a situation like this, 
and my body's in this state, what happened next? And that's your brain's prediction. It's making a similarity judgment. And when I say that's your brain's prediction, I don't mean that your brain is then, you know, in an abstract way kind of thinking something. A prediction is a plan for action. Your brain actually starts to change your heart rate and, and flood you with cortisol because you're gonna need glucose in a minute. And it starts to change your breathing and it starts to prepare that motor response to let you run if you're predicting a snake. Now, um, what happens next is that usually your brain will take in the sense data from the world if, oh, I should say, sorry, your brain also prepares you to see a snake. So it's actually changing the firing of its own neurons to prepare you to act and to prepare you to, um, and it starts to change the physical state of your body, which you experience as affect. So even before you, the, the snake actually slithers out from under that book, you know, leaves, your brain is already changing the firing of its own neurons so that you will feel something different. You will pre be prepared to act and you will, it's preparing you to see that snake like literally to see it. And if the snake slithers out at that point, the input, the sense data from the snake just confirms the predictions and off you go. You're like, cause you're already, all of that, that, that it's all set up already. You can just, the brain just executes it. Um, the body just executes the response that the brain is already prepared. If there is no snake there though, like let's say it's a little animal that crawls out or it's just the wind what happens? Well, one possibility is that um, your brain adjusts itself and it do you don't see a snake. And you might just be left with this like really uncomfortable feeling of feeling like really jittery and worked up because your brain was already preparing you to run. It just, you know, it corrected its prediction because there was information there that was unpredicted. So we call that, we have a really fancy name for that. We call it learning. That's what learning <laughs> is. Your brain learns something new and it will use that learning the next time it has to predict. Alternatively, your brain might not update its predictions. You might see a snake where there is no snake. Then that can happen for a bunch of different reasons that you can see something that's not there or not see something that is there or hear something that's not there and so on and so forth. Because your brain is always working by prediction. It's always preparing your actions and your sensations and your feelings by prediction, um, by using past experiences to predict what's gonna happen next. And so if your brain is using past experiences of fear, then your brain is preparing you to make fear. If your brain is using past experiences of anger for you, then it's preparing you to experience, to, to have anger. Um, and sometimes if your brain really believes that you are, if your brain has reason to believe that your life is at stake, it won't wait and check. It will just prepare the response and execute it without checking. Um, because sometimes, you know, let's just say that when your heart rate's around 180 beats a minute and you're really, you know, you're really worked up, it's actually, your brain doesn't, sample the world very well. It's really using its internal model mostly, its own predictions. And it's not really checking with the world too much, just because it's physically just not, not feasible. What an incredible tool that we all have. And what an incredible, you know, awareness that we now have so much better by having this conversation with you, Lisa. I know we could literally probably spend three, four, five more hours on this particular topic, and we might scratch the surface. So maybe that'll be our call for discussion number two in the future. But Lisa, this has been phenomenal. I really, really appreciate you taking time. I want to transition into our rapid fire section. We call it the rare air questionnaire. We're having a rare conversation. We're inqu inquiring about the depths of our mind and this gift that we all have. And so I'd love to ask you a few questions as a, you know, what I would call a prolific author yourself. I'd be curious, um, are there two or three books that you've read over the past few years that have been really impactful for you? 
Oh gosh, lots of books are impactful to me. Um, I just read, um, I just finished Metazoa by uh, Peter Godfrey Smith, who's a philosopher. And I loved that book. I thought it was a really fun romp. It's all about consciousness and the evolution of consciousness. And I, I don't agree with everything he says about emotion, but, uh, but I still thought it was a really, really fun book. Um, I also read, I just read a, a book by um, uh, Scott Turner called, he's a, ph a physiologist called um, uh, The Tinkerer's Accomplice. And it's really all about how animals kind of treat the environment as extended part of their bodies to get stuff done, which I just also, again, thought it was like super, super, super interesting book. Um, I read, I reread recently Tim Snyder's um, On Tyranny. Everybody should read that book. Um, uh, and um, Anne Applebaum also has a book on um, authoritarianism, the, the lure of authoritarianism. I can't remember the exact title though. Um, it's called uh, Twilight of Democracy. Um, I thought that was a fantastic book. And then um, there's a really wonderful book by, um, this one I, I, is not a recent thing that I read, but I, I read it a long time ago, but I often reread it. Um, it's called um, The Triple Helix by uh, um, Richard Lewontin. And it's a book about, it's a book, it's a little book that helps you understand how evolution works. That's fantastic. We'll put links in the show notes to all those books. So thank you for that. I haven't dove into any of those. So I'm excited to uh, inquire myself. And I know the listeners are as well. And we'll, of course, put links in the show notes of where you can find seven and a half lessons about the brain, as well as how emotions are made Great. by Lisa as well. And Lisa, I've got two final questions for you. What is the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis? Um, I go to, I get enough sleep. Seriously, for real, that is a real answer. Um, uh, and I, um, either in the morning before I get out of bed or right, or, or before I go to sleep, I turn to my husband, I look at my husband, I think I'm really, really, really lucky to be with this person. Really lucky to be with this person. I'm really lucky to have the life that I have. So I basically have a moment of gratitude um, and, um, and I try to do, I know this sounds so corny, but it's actually really true. I try to cultivate uh, a moment of awe every day for five minutes. And uh, I try to do something nice for somebody else. You know, maybe it's like baking bread for my neighbor or, you know, um, you know, proofreading something for my, you know, friends or my kid or whatever. But, you know, actually, these are the kinds of things that help me be the kind of person I want to be. That's so powerful. I love that. A moment of awe. That's a great, uh, great sound bite there in itself. But what's the biggest way that you elevate others around you, Lisa? By example, I would say. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Lisa, this has been fantastic. Really have learned so much about this beautiful tool that we all have called our brain and how we can use that to maximize our life and how the awareness of all of the inner workings can truly help us transform our reality. And so thank you so much for being on the show. Is there any parting thoughts or words of wisdom that you share with Elevate Nation today? No, this was really fun. I really, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk with you. It was really, um, it was really a great experience. So thank you. Oh, well, that's, that's very kind of you to say it's been a, all the pleasure has been mine. So let me just tell you that. And Lisa, I just want to uh, thank you again. And I look forward to part two of our discussion until next time, Lisa, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thank you. Wow. Elevate nation. What do you know about what just happened to us? So this awareness of our amazing mind can really shape our reality. And I think it's so important that we talk to people like Lisa Barrett, because she is an expert, right? She is literally among the top 1% of most cited scientists in the world for her revolutionary research in psychology and neuroscience. So how can we understand, you know, these insights and how can we apply them and really gain an understanding of this beautiful tool that we all have, right? So that we can show up so that we can 
understand our affect or our summary of our body budget or recognize that, you know, decisions that we make are either withdrawals or deposits, you know, in our affect, in our energy level and in, you know, really the underlying circumstances of our emotions. It is so, so powerful. So I hope that you guys have really found a ton of value from this discussion, from this podcast, because that's what it's all about. It's all about understanding, applying and believing and really, really tapping into the limitlessness that we all have because we're all designed to be great. We are all designed to achieve great things in our life. And it all starts really within our mind, within our body, within our heart and within our soul. And so I'm just excited about this. I'm, I hope that you are as well. I want to encourage you to re-listen to the show because I guarantee there's so much there that you will learn when you re-listen to the show. So I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you also to distill it down. What are your top three distinctions, your top three takeaways from this episode and share those with a friend. Let your friend know or your colleague or you know your business partner or your spouse or maybe it's somebody within your family. Share this with them and let them know, hey, these are the three things that I really got from this. I'd be curious to know what are the three things that you get from it because we all have a mind, right? We all have a mind. We all have a brain. And how can we maximize this amazing tool rather than just let it be you know, sort of underutilized in so many different capacities. So I want to encourage you to re-listen to the show. I want to encourage you, most importantly, to take massive, massive action and apply these learnings to your life and to your habits and to who you are as an investor, as an entrepreneur, as a father, son, you know, brother, sister, wife, what have you, whatever you are, apply this in all categories of your life because how you do anything is how you do everything. And guys, I just want to thank you, Elevate Nation. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit elevatepod.com.